great. So I think we have everyone. I want to welcome you today. I'm Joanna Scavoni. I will be your moderator for today um, with this esteemed panel and really exciting program that we have, uh, weaponizing the First Amendment. Um, so we're thrilled to have about 150 of you online today to join us for this exciting dialogue, this all-star panel lineup that we've got. And I have just a few housekeeping matters to take care of before we dive into, uh, into the panel, which I know is what you're here for. Um, as an initial matter, I want to extend our gratitude to Howard Wayne. Howard is the co-chair of the San Diego Lawyer Chapter of ACS. And Howard really conceived of the topic for today's discussion and recruited all of our panelists um, to this panel. And so we want to thank Howard for putting together this program and also bringing on all of the co-sponsors. We have more than 10 chapter co-sponsors today uh, for this program all across the country, up and down California, um, and all the way to the East Coast. So welcome to all of you who are here. And thank you again to Howard and the San Diego chapter for putting this together. Um, just a brief word about the American Constitution Society, because I do think we have some non-members here today. And so I want to let you know a little bit about ACS. So the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, we work to uphold a 21st century uh, vision of the Constitution, that law is a force for protecting our democracy and the public interest and for improving people's lives. And we do that through a diverse um, network of attorneys and law students. We have more than 200 chapters across the country. And if you're interested in learning more about ACS, well, you had to register for today's event. So take a gander at our website. Um, we have a lot of really terrific programming. You can check out the virtual convention uh, that was hosted in June with a lot of really great webinar content that you can access. Uh, so we invite you to learn more about that. And if you're a law student who's tuning in today and you're starting your virtual semester at your law student, uh, at your law school, I encourage you to reach out to ACS and help us help you become a mentee. We have lots of mentors in our community that want to help grow the ranks among law students and to help you navigate uh, this particularly extraordinary time. So we hope that you will take advantage of getting connected to the ACS network at your law school uh, and also to our lawyer chapters. All right, with that out of the way, um, a bit of structure for today. We have these four amazing panelists. Um, I'm gonna ask some prompting questions at each of them. They're gonna talk about their expertise on the topic and we're gonna leave time for question and answer at the end. So as your questions, as you're thinking of your questions, you can feel free to type them into the Q&A box. Um, and then I will address those at the end and pitch them out to the panelists um, as relevant. So um, without further ado, I would like to invite Dean Erwin Chimerinsky to join us. He is the Dean and a, a law professor at UC Berkeley. He is a preeminent scholar, a constitutional law scholar, and his most recent book, I think, is of particular interest to our ACS community. It is called We the People, A Progressive Reading of the Constitution for the 21st Century. So we're really honored to have Erwin with us today. And so Erwin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a broad question to kind of kick things off uh, here and ask you, what does it mean to weaponize the First Amendment. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for including me on this distinguished panel. The phrase weaponizing the First Amendment comes from a dissent from Justice Elena Kagan in 2018. Now, obviously, we might think of any use of the First Amendment to strike down something the government is doing as weaponizing it. But I think she means something different by it, and I think we mean something different by it today. What we're talking about is using the First Amendment to challenge progressive legislation, often economic and social legislation. It's not about government regulation of speech in the usual sense. It's not using the First Amendment to challenge the government's regulation of political protests. It's not about using the First Amendment to challenge the government regulation of the use of public property for speech. It's really about conservatives using the First Amendment to challenge progressive legislation like campaign finance legislation, laws protecting unions, laws protecting gays and lesbians, laws regulating tobacco or guns. And it's conservatives using the First Amendment to challenge this type of government regulation. I think I can make this less abstract by pointing to two very important examples. One from a decade ago, 
that probably everyone's familiar with, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. It involved the McCain-Feingold Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act. It did many things, but among them, it limited the expenditures for broadcast advertising by corporations and unions for primary and general elections. What's often forgotten is that this was challenged and before the Supreme Court in 2003. In a McConnell versus Federal Election Commission, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of these restrictions on corporate and union spending. But in 2010, in Citizens United, the Supreme Court overruled McConnell. What changed in seven years? Had the court found some musty history of the First Amendment that led it to believe it made a mistake? No, what changed was Justice Sandra O'Connor was part of the majority in McConnell, but she was replaced by Justice Alito, who joined the dissenters from that decision to create a new majority to overrule McConnell and declare unconstitutional the restrictions on expenditures in McCain-Feingold. It's often forgotten that corporations and unions could engage in expenditures long before McCain-Feingold and after McCain-Feingold. They would just need to create political action committees to raise the money and spend the money. What Citizens United was about was the ability of corporations to use money directly from their treasurers to get candidates elected or defeated. Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court. He was joined by the four conservative justices who were then with him, Chief Justice Roberts, Descalia, Thomas, and Alito. And Justice Kennedy said that spending money in elections is protected by the First Amendment, that corporations have First Amendment rights, and he rejected the idea that there was sufficient government interest to allow such restrictions. I think that the majority very much weaponized the First Amendment. They used the First Amendment to strike down an important government regulation, and it certainly wasn't a regulation of speech as we'd normally use the word. I think there are many things that were wrong with Justice Kennedy's majority opinion. One is, I think it's wrong to equate spending money in an election campaign with speech. I know there's an expression, money talks, but this really takes that figurative expression far too literally. Now, this isn't the first case where the Supreme Court said that. In 1976, in Buckley versus Vallejo, the court said spending money is speech but I would really disagree with that characterization. Spending money is a form of conduct that may express a message, but it's not pure speech. Also, I very much question that corporations should have free speech rights. Speech is protected as part of the autonomy of each of us as individuals. Corporations don't have autonomy. Now, the Supreme Court had earlier said in First National Bank of Boston versus Bellotti, we protect the speech of corporations because the more expression, the better off we're informed. But that means we protect corporate speech for instrumental reasons. And if instrumentally there are reasons why we're better off without corporate expenditures, then that would be justified. And that's what I think Justice Kennedy missed. Large corporate expenditures have the chance of distorting the political process. It's less likely to happen in a presidential election where such enormous amounts are spent. But I very much worry in local elections where there's less name recognition for the candidates or judicial elections where the spending of money by corporations can and does make all the difference. My point is, this is such a clear example of the Supreme Court weaponizing the First Amendment. I wanna talk about a second example also, one that may be less familiar, though it's more recent. It's the Supreme Court's decision in 2018 in National Federation of Life Advocates versus Becerra. California had a law that said that facilities that provide reproductive health care to women must post notices on their walls. The notice had to say that the state of California would make available free or low cost abortion and contraceptives for women who economically qualify. Also, unlicensed facilities had to post they weren't licensed to provide health care. Why did California find it necessary to do this? Well, it turns out 
a number of anti-abortion groups advertise themselves as providing pregnancy counseling, and women would go there thinking that they might obtain an abortion only for those facilities to be affiliated with religion and not inform women in terms of the services, the resources available for the state. It's important to keep in mind that the California law didn't require that anyone in these facilities say anything. All it required was a notice posted on the wall saying, the state will provide free and low-cost contraception abortion for women ignorantly qualified. And what I would think would be the non-controversial requirement that unlicensed facilities had to tell women they weren't licensed to provide health care. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit upheld this as constitutional, but the Supreme Court in a five to four decision reversed. The Supreme Court in an opinion by Justice Thomas said that whenever the government regulates speech based on content, it must meet what's called strict scrutiny. Its action must be necessary to achieve a compelling purpose. He said, this is a regulation of speech based on content. It regulates the content of what might be posted. He said, this is compelled speech under the First Amendment. Now, he didn't deny that the state has an important interest in making sure that women know of what the state is willing to pay for. Instead, what he said was, the state could achieve this goal through other means. The state could post billboards, or the state could take out public service announcements to inform women of this. In terms of what I thought was the non-controversial requirement that unlicensed facilities would have to post that, he said there's no proof that women in the state don't know when a facility is unlicensed and declared it unconstitutional on that basis. Again, to me, this is truly weaponizing the First Amendment. Justice Breyer wrote a powerful dissent here. He explained that countless laws require disclosures. There are disclosures of all sorts in the employment context, in the toxic substance context, and we go on with a huge list. What Justice Breyer said is, this now makes all of those disclosure requirements vulnerable because all prescribe the content of the disclosure. All are therefore going to be subjected to strict scrutiny. And it isn't always the case that there's some other way of informing people. It's always possible to put up billboards. It's always possible to take out public service announcements. And his prophecy has come true in the sense that there have been so many challenges to disclosure requirements over the last couple of years. I think this was a court that was hostile to abortion rights, singling out a kind of disclosure that was really about protecting women and really about protecting reproductive choice. So again, this fits what I said at the beginning. It's about using the First Amendment to challenge progressive legislation, economic and social legislation, and I think it's a very troubling trend. So thank you, Dean, for that perspective about how the free speech clause really has been weaponized in those two arenas, campaign finance and reproductive rights. We're going to talk about a couple of other areas of law with some of our other panelists, but I'd like to, to ask you to think about what you think are the issues that are on the horizon. Um, and so I'm going to pitch that to everyone when we come back. Um, but our next panelist is uh, Ruben Garcia. So Ruben, thanks so much for joining us today. Ruben is... Yep professor uh, and co-director of the Workplace Law Program at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, he also teaches um, in labor and employment law, and he practiced for a number of years uh, in labor and employment law representing employees and unions. And so he's going to bring really a practical perspective today for those of you who are litigators on the ground about, um, about our, our topic. So Ruben, I'd, I'd like to pitch it to you. Um, can you shed some light on how labor and employment law intersects with a weaponized First Amendment? I, sure, and uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be on this panel. Um, I'm going to talk uh, primarily about Janice versus Ask Me Council 31 as an example of the weaponizing of the First Amendment. Um, there is a longer history to it than just the 2018 Janice case, but uh, as Dean Chemerinsky said, 
Uh, the term weaponizing the First Amendment was first used in a Supreme Court case by Justice Elena Kagan in her, what I would call, you know, a stinging dissent. And I know that may be overused as a description of uh, dissenting opinions from the bench, but uh, a stinging dissent in Janus where she said that the majority's decision prevented the American people acting through their state and local officials from making important decisions about workplace government. Uh, and it does so by weaponizing the First Amendment in a way that unleashes judges now and in the future to intervene in economic and regulatory policy. And that was not citing to Lochner versus New York, uh, you know, that from, from 1903, it was not, uh, you know, uh, she did not use the term uh, Lochner any, anywhere in the dissent, um, but it's clear that she was critiquing the decision in Lochnerian terms. Again, that the sin of Janus is really that the court was depriving elected officials from deciding what they felt was best uh, for the organization of their workforces under the guise of the First Amendment, uh, it, it, rather than that discredited strain of substantive due process that Lochner used. Uh, she also said, again, that, that the court, uh, as, as Dean Chemerinsky pointed out in the case of Nifla versus Becerra, just the day before uh, the, the, the Janus decision was announced, the uh, Nifla decision uh, was also an example of the weaponization of the First Amendment. Now, Janus is not the first time that the First Amendment has been weaponized against workers. And there have been several other instances which I could talk about where the First Amendment has frustrated state and federal legislative goals uh, when it comes to unions. Um, but I think Janet, Justice Kagan probably said it best in her dissent when she said that the Janus case created a carve out to the usual principles of the First Amendment for public se sector unions only. Right? And, and that was because she said uh, the court wanted to pick uh, the winning side. Um, so, so again, in terms of the, the, the pedigree of this kind of jurisprudence, I mean, we, we could look at a number of examples from labor law, which as Joanna said, I, 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 I work in, um, but, but, but you know, I'm gonna sort of skip over that to go straight to what Janice uh, said by its terms, right? In terms of this particular situation, because it does require explaining a little bit about how labor law and public sector worked anyway, before uh, the Janice case in 2018. Um, so in Janus, uh, in a five to four vote, the court held that government employees who were covered by a union contract, that is the union represents them in collective bargaining because it's legally required to, cannot be required to pay any fees for the services that the union is providing them. Uh, the case uh, overturned the 1977 precedent of Abood versus Detroit Board of Education, uh, where the court uh, struck a compromise uh, between uh, the uh, employee's ability to opt out of union membership, but still be required to pay a fair share fee for union representation. And that was the portion of union dues, which was the cost of collective bargaining and grievance uh, representation. But this fair share fee assumes a system of exclusive representation. And that is when a union is selected by a majority of workers at a given workplace, that union becomes the exclusive represent, representative of the workers and the union owes th those workers a duty of fair uh, representation. So the court in Abood, uh, in order to avoid the, the problem of, of employees receiving union representation or collective bargaining or uh, uh, wage increases or grievance representation without paying for it, uh, agreed that the, the burden on First Amendment rights uh, for paying for that uh, service uh, was was not uh, so great that it that it uh, you know did al allowed for states or didn't allow for states to charge the agency fee. Um, but whether or not they opted out or not, uh, non-members cannot be required to pay for political spending, and that of course again is is because of the. Uh, the, the reasoning uh, of the political uh, spending is uh, pure political speech, uh, whereas the fees, uh, at least bef uh, before uh, Janus, were not. So Janus built on the cases of uh, Harris versus Quinn uh, a few years earlier, uh, where the court uh, had this much the same kind of uh, approach to um, public sector union or employed by the government uh, in home care f facilities and in home care situations. And, and that was the first inkling uh, that uh, at that point that the court was looking seriously at overruling Abood and uh, over, overturning fair share fees. So Justice Alito uh, writing for the majority, which included 
uh, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Kennedy, Thomas, and Gorsuch states that um, stare decisis, i.e. the Abu decision, applies with less force when fundamental free speech rights are at stake. Uh, he also said that the political and economic environment uh, had significantly changed uh, since Abood in 1977. He also uh, said that in addition to forbidding uh, agency fees that employees had to opt in uh, to the system. And again, that uh, means a lot in terms of the stability of bargaining relationships and the stability of the uh, union's uh, uh, bargaining strategies uh, when, uh, again, that, that kind of uh, um, funding of those, of those strategies are, is, is so unstable. So the dissent, as I said, uh, included Justice Kagan, written by Justice Kagan, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Ginsburg Breyer, and Sotomayor. And according to them, nothing had changed except uh, the justices in a boot, right? At that point, uh, you know, you had Justice Gorsuch um, joining the court. Um, Justice Kavanaugh had not yet joined, um, but the, the membership of the court had changed. And, and again, uh, the pedigree of this um, going back to Harris versus Quinn and other decisions, uh, which really began to use the First Amendment to uh, change the um, democratic choices that many states had made, 22 states out of 50 uh, by that point. So, uh, and again, uh, in terms of reaching that decision, the, the majority had to argue and assume that everything the union does is at some point political. Everything, all bargaining by a public sector union is political speech. And that was just a, a vast, broad brush, I think, that simply, uh, in my experience, is not borne out um, by reality. Um, so again, the goals, we're going to talk a little bit about the consequences and goals of Janus, but clearly, um, you know, public sector unions, as you can look for, see from the data, are becoming much more of a, of a share of the labor movement, about 33% of uh, um, the, the union membership in the country is based on public sector uh, unions, uh, and they have been very political and certainly very political in, in various states. Uh, and so that was, again, in terms of what the, the goals might have been in terms of the, the consequences of this decision, we can talk about, you know, whether that has had the, the uh, desired impact uh, yet. Um, but in the end, I, I think, you know, we can also talk and I look forward to discussing in uh, the conversation about strategies even outside of the uh, First Amendment uh, in terms of the um, you know, dealing with the, uh, the Janus decision. And, and I'll also talk a little bit about, you know, the litigation that the Janus decision has spawned uh, in terms of uh, uh, employees uh, seeking to get back dues that they had paid in the 51 years that the unions had relied upon the Abu decision to collect uh, agency fees. But again, the, the weaponization of the First Amendment, as I see it, uh, is, is well uh, exemplified by this case. Uh, and it may require uh, unions and uh, new strategies by unions and employees themselves uh, to also look at the First Amendment to challenge uh, longstanding uh, laws that have burdened uh, union First Amendment rights. And at least uh, in the next few years, we might be able to see how successful those strategies might be. But I'll stop there and look forward to questions. Good. Thank you so much, Ruben. And so then I'll ask you to think about the same question that I pitched uh, to Dean Chemerinsky about sort of the, those issues that you mentioned, you sort of previewed the issues that you see on the horizon percolating out of a, a, the post-Janus world that we have. Um, and thank you also for addressing the, the sort of political consequences of Janus and we may get some more questions on that. Um, so next we're gonna turn uh, to Ted Merman. Um, so Ted is the interim director of the UC Berkeley Center for Consumer Law and Economic Justice and he's co-founder and executive director of the Public Good Law Center. He also spent several years as a deputy attorney general in the state of California litigating consumer cases. So again, he brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise as an on the ground litigator. And he's also advised agencies on creating good, um, you know, uh, uh, proposing laws and adopting regulations in, in the areas of consumer protection and public health. So Ted, thanks so much for being with us today. Um, and so I understand you're going to sort of address with us how uh, the First Amendment, this litigation about weaponizing the First Amendment and the free speech clause is intersecting with commercial speech. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'll ask you this question. Um, how is the First Amendment being used as a deregulatory tool by business? Thanks, Joanna. And it's, it, thank you all. It's good to be back at the San Diego uh, ACS chapter. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to giving you an overview of the, the perils and the weaponization of the First Amendment as it 
uh, affects consumer protection, and particularly as uh, it affects the, the commercial speech doctrine, a very brief piece of history, uh, commercial speech advertising, uh, never used to be protected under the First Amendment. It wasn't until the mid-1970s, the 1976 case, Virginia Pharmacy Board, that the, the Supreme Court uh, extended First Amendment protection to commercial speech. Uh, by 1980, uh, the court had had, uh, had decided a number of cases, and it formulated the sort of intermediate scrutiny uh, standard of the Central Hudson test. Um, uh, those of you will you'll all remember this, of course, from your bar exam. Uh, certainly, having Dean Chemerinsky here will bring you back to those days of the bar exam, so that will it will prompt you to remember this. Um, there was a back and forth uh, about whether laws were struck down or not. Uh, laws restricting commercial speech advertising until uh, probably mid 90s and then finally codified in 2001 uh, in the Laurelard versus Riley case. The dean mentioned tobacco. This was the big case uh, involving uh, tobacco billboards and the court held that uh, that uh, Massachusetts complete ban on tobacco billboards within a thousand feet of a school was too broad under uh, that intermediate scrutiny of the Central Hudson test. Well, 2001 is pretty much when I started in this field. I was at the Attorney General's office, and uh, I somehow uh, just got involved in doing First Amendment cases and commercial speech cases. I've been doing them since. Um, and un unfortunately, since about 2001, uh, it, there has been a general deregulatory festival uh, at the Supreme Court. Uh, and I, I'll say that there are uh, three separate uh, destructive forces at work. Um, here, one uh, unification, one intensification, and one expansion. Uh, so the first, uh, unification, a destruction of barriers between different categories of speech. It used to be that the, the Supreme Court happily created different standards for different contexts uh, within the, the ambit of the free speech clause. It's been moving rapidly in the opposite direction uh, over the last several decades, certainly the last two decades. Uh, second, the increasing intensity of First Amendment scrutiny overall. And third, the widening scope of what is considered speech. So together you have uh, what I sometimes refer to as the blob. It clears everything in its path, all government regulation of, uh, of uh, the commercial sector, and it grows bigger and stronger. Uh, the, the blob is not acting on its own. There may be ideology at work, but the, the practical effect is, as you mentioned, Joanna, uh, simply deregulation. Uh, in the service of uh, increasing uh, corporate profit, uh, excuse me, corporate freedom, uh, the, the modern First Amendment makes it harder for the government to do its job of ensuring a fair marketplace. So let's look at a couple of the cases on today's agenda. Up close, they look a little incoherent, um, but seen through a deregulatory and ideological lens, they, they begin to make a certain sinister sort of sense. Uh, NIFLA versus Becerra, that's the, uh, the case involving signs in crisis, crisis pregnancy centers that Dean Chemerinsky mentioned, spends a lot of time uh, really uh, blasting <laughs> the uh, professional speech doctrine, the idea that government could regulate uh, professionals, the speech of professionals, more readily than it could others. Uh, and then it sort of tosses it aside and decides the case on other grounds. Well, why did it have that entire uh, 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 sally into that area then? Well, it affects the agenda of a unified First Amendment. No new separate categories of speech. The court, Tom, uh, Justice Thomas, applied content discrimination to disclosures. Well, that doesn't really make sense, does it? How can you have, I mean, a required disclosure by the government if it doesn't have a particular kind of content? Of course, there's gonna be some sort of looking at content. Um, so why, why use that, that ill-fitting tool with disclosures? Well, uh, content discrimination is the standard that the court is using to strike down restrictions, restrictions on commercial speech and disclosures and restrictions, formerly treated separately, now much more interchangeable. 
the court looks at, the, at this as it had in a number of cases before uh, and asks, is it commercial speech or not? Well, the court doesn't ever say. It applies commercial and non-commercial speeches cases indiscriminately. They used to be treated separately, but now with the unification of the First Amendment, they're not. Let's go back to uh, another case that, that we, uh, we said we'd talk about. Um, in many ways, uh, for the 21st century, certainly in the last decade, uh, one of the leading uh, Supreme Court commercial speech cases, this is uh, restrictions on commercial speech called Sorrell versus IMS Health from 2011. Uh, pharmacies collect information about doctors' prescribing habits. That information is valuable to drug companies. Uh, which want to know which doctors are prescribing a generic drug rather than the company's still patented version so they can go and talk to those doctors. Uh, the, the Vermont uh, barred the sale of that information because it violated doctors' privacy and pushed healthcare prices for the state higher. Uh, the court held, though, that the restriction was content and speaker based. Why? Because academics were still permitted to use the information and maybe some others. Um, the court struck down the law. Uh, invoking heightened scrutiny, uh, not clear which exact standard was being used, but something certainly more than rational basis. Um, up close, again, the, uh, the op opinion is a little incoherent. Where's the speech? There's no bar on marketing, just on selling the data used to inform the marketing. And discrimination, not really a lot of other uses for the data beyond marketing. But if we look at the agenda that Justice Kennedy uh, like Justice Thomas, an advocate of the Unified First Amendment, was advancing, uh, we, we do see uh, something perhaps familiar. Uh, the unification agenda before Sorrell, it was relatively unusual for the court to rely on non-commercial speech cases in a commercial speech uh, decision. Not anymore. Uh, the increasing intensity. Heightened scrutiny sounds vague, but every time the court refuses to decide whether strict or intermediate scrutiny uh, or something in between applies, it has to strike down the law under the lower standard. It doesn't matter which standard we apply since it can't survive even the more lenient one. And that has the effect of raising the lower standard, of making it more imposing as an obstacle. Third, the scope of the First Amendment. Uh, it seemed the court meant speaking based on a database with speech, but no. The creation and, and I quote here, the creation and dissemination of information are speech for First Amendment purposes. Well, it's a good thing that so little these days is data, right? Or else our government might be looking at real difficulty in regulating commercial activity because it's all being transformed into speech. And that, of course, is what this is all about, the deregulatory agenda. This is as far as I know, the first commercial speech case after about 35 years in which the court explicitly says that corporations are, that commercial speakers have a First Amendment right to speak. This is the year right after Citizens United. Previously, it was the individual's First Amendment right to receive that commercial information. And so what's the effect here? Let's look at the lower courts. Uh, in a recent case, a test case, in fact, uh, in the Ninth Circuit. The Pacific Coast Horseshoeing School versus Kirchmeier decided just this summer, the Ninth Circuit held that higher education involves speech to such a degree that a government limit on who can enroll in a for-profit college uh, is subject to heightened scrutiny under the First Amendment. Think about that for a minute. Here you have an industry, uh, for-profit colleges, notorious for fraud, the Corinthian College scandal, ITT Tech, some real estate university, you may recall. But because that industry involves speech, the government can't readily regulate it. Well, imagine what that means for the 90-10 rule or any special requirements for for-profit colleges to establish they're not ripping students off. And then imagine what this reasoning means for other industries that involve speech, like, say, lawyers. NIFLA tells us that professional speech is not a separate category permitting greater regulation. The horseshoeing case suggests uh, that speech-infused industry like lawyering can be regulated only in ways that apply to all industries like fire codes or that can pass heightened scrutiny. So what happens to ethical rules or restrictions on what a lawyer can't say or has to disclose to a client? And what about investment advising or psychotherapy? The list goes on. So. Uh, in the middle of this apocalyptic time, we have come to ACS and made things really depressing. Uh, but I would just say to, the, to all of you, 
don't despair. The Lochner era lasted a few decades, and then in a time of economic crisis with four horsemen on the Supreme Court, when government activity was desperately needed, that era ended. I leave it to you to draw your own parallels. Uh, and I give you just a brief charge that students and scholars among you, we need new ways of conceiving the First Amendment and why it really matters, new definitions that will allow the democratic process to work. Please get on that. Practicing lawyers, you too. Find examples of speech regulation that judges will care about. Robocalls, for example. Bring your own test cases. You can fight against the blob because eventually the good guys will turn it back. We always do. Thank you. Ted, I appreciate that perspective. Um, and I can already see that um, some question askers are lining up on, uh, even on the robocall, we have a question in the pipeline. So get to thinking about, about that one. Um, we're gonna jump to our next speaker. So I'm thrilled to invite um, Larry Alexander, who is a professor at USD School of Law here in San Diego with me. Um, he teaches in a number of areas, but most relevant for today, he teaches constitutional law, legal theory, and also religious freedom and separation of church and state. And so, Larry, I'm going to pitch it to you again in a broad sense and ask, um, what are your thoughts? Do you agree with the premise of the discussion today that the Supreme Court is weaponizing the First Amendment? What's your take on the cases we've been discussing? Thank, thank you, Joanna, and uh, thank you to, to my panelists. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to um, get to your, your question in a moment, but I'm going to put my priors on the table so everybody can see. I, I, I should have worn my Darth Vader mask here because I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the, 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 the naysayer, the, uh, the uh, gainsayer of uh, much that has been said before. So um, as I told Johanna, as we did a sort of pre-webinar um, uh, discussion, organizational discussion, um, I'm not a member of ACS. I'm a member of its FOIL. I'm a member of the Federal, Federalist Society. Um, and I quipped to her, I said, you know, we in the Federalist Society are interested in the Constitution we have. You and the ACS are interested in the Constitution you'd like to have. And she responded, uh, said, no, 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 we're interested in the Constitution we have. We just think it's a, you know, a living, progressive kind of Constitution. Um, and uh, so that's that's uh, that's that's what was our little exchange. But let me just uh, go on on this point for a moment because it's quite relevant to the topic today. Um, now I prefer a dead constitution, not a living constitution. Um, like the uh, Articles of Confederation or the Constitution of the uh, Confederate States of America, these are dead constitutions. Um, nobody looks at the articles or at the, the Constitution of the Confederacy and says, you know, how can we make this sort of uh, progressive? It means, you know, it means what it means. It doesn't mean, you know, anything we would like it to mean. Um, well, I feel the same way about our Constitution. It's a dead Constitution. The only difference between it and the articles or the uh, Constitution of the Confederacy is that it has to be applied today. Otherwise, it's a dead document and would be approached the same way, uh, should be approached the same way that we approach these other documents. Now, with respect to living constitutions, um, let's, uh, let's be frank about what is involved in the living constitution approach. Judges will be crafting the meaning um, of the words, any meaning that the words can bear, as long as uh, you know, uh, they will be crafting their own preferred norms to those laws, um, rather than the meanings that the persons who put those words there meant by them. So that's a major difference. And that means that the, the judges will be, in effect, the Constitution makers. They will be authoring the Constitution because words can bear, once you detach them from what their users meant by them, those words can bear you know, an indefinite number of meanings. So uh, judges under the living constitution approach will declare certain norms to be the supreme law of the land and they will then overturn democratically enacted laws based on norms that these judges have made. Now, I prefer, I, I have a great respect for judges, but I prefer the judge, judges who are not in the role of platonic guardians. Um, and you see the consequences 
of this of, of the living constitutional approach in today's confirmation proceedings of justice. They become, because so much becomes uh, uh, at stake, um, if the judges are going to be making up the rules, um, then, you know, so much becomes, uh, so the, the, the confirmation of judges becomes highly consequential, perhaps even more consequential than, you know, the election of the president or Congress. So uh, that leads to nasty, hyper-partisan confirmation proceedings. And it's not a healthy, it's not a healthy term. Um, now, so if you say to me, you know, the, uh, what the judges have said free speech entails is not what the framers meant by free speech, then, you're, then we, we can have a conversation. You're, you're playing in my ballpark. But if you say to me, the free speech uh, norms made by the judges are undesirable, they're not progressive enough and so forth, my response is live by the sword, die by the sword. Now, the question, you know, is the, is, or the recent free speech uh, decisions by the court part of a, um, and I'm quoting from the, the, the flyer we had, a part of a corporate and right-wing effort to undermine progressive values. I think that's risible, um, you know, verging on hysterical. Um, think about some of the justices in the, on the Supreme Court and ask, you know, are they, are, is it really, you know, what, right to think of them as sort of corporate or right-wing tools, you know, um, enacting some sort of sinister um, uh, right-wing corporate plot. Um, think about Justice Kennedy. He was, he was the, the, the real free speech hawk. Um, and whatever you can say about Justice Kennedy, and, you know, I, I'm as critical of Justice Kennedy as, as anyone. Um, he was surely not some sort of corporate tool. Um, Justice Kennedy was, you know, uh, I think what actually defines his approach is he was a lover of liberty. You can see this in all of his um, individual rights uh, opinions, not just the free speech stuff, but um, the uh, same-sex marriage decision, which he wrote. Um, so, um, um, I think, I think this idea that there's some sort of nefarious plot um, being somehow communicated through the uh, certain justices on the court um, uh, to undermine progressive drives, I think that's, I think that's you know, um, a, a, a crazy conspiracy theory. Um, let me comment on a, on a couple of the cases um, that are sort of be, you know, trotted forth as evidence of this, um, Citizens United. Now, Irwin mentioned uh, quite correctly that the entities protected under the Citizens United decision were not just corporations, but were unions. And um, last I looked um, at the uh, relative spending in elections, um, union contributions actually uh, were out, outspent corporate um, expenditures in, in these elections. So the unions are the ones who really benefited. So it's hard to hard to imagine that Citizens United was a, a sort of a, a sort of right wing corporate um, uh, decision. Um, Irwin uh, says, you know, uh, spending money um, is not speech. Well, in a sense, right? That spending money is not speech. But when you spend money to purchase speech, like you know, want to take out an ad in the in the New York Times, you got to spend money. Um, you want to, uh, in, in fact, most speech, it, it takes resources. Um, and um, so I think that, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go into trying to defend it, you know, uh, Citizens United. It's a controversial decision. I don't see it as somehow um, a, a indicator of some sort of nefarious plot. Let me also talk about Janus. Uh, this is what Ruben uh, discussed. Um, the basic point in Janus is that um, anything done in terms of collective bargaining by a public employee union is inherently political. So that Mr. Janus, um, he, 
his his view is I don't want to I don't want to give money to a political organization whose views I don't subscribe to uh, any more than you or I want to give our money to the party we oppose or to some organization whose views we oppose. Um, Mr. Janice said, you know, when you when the public employee union engages in bargaining uh, with the city or county, um, then everything is entirely political. If if money is going to if we're going to get higher wages for our employees, that means lower wages for someone else or money taken out of health care or, or paving the streets or police departments. That's inherently political. You don't have to look at uh, the uh, Los Angeles Teachers Union, um, who, who says there's a demand in, in collective bargaining that um, uh, we're not going to uh, go back to work if, unless the police are defunding, defunded. That's clearly political, but everything else that's done by public employee unions is political, including just bargaining over, over wages and hours. So, um, I will, I will stop. I'm not going to defend the Becerra case. Um, I'm not sure I agree with it. Um, I'm not sure I agree with Sorrell, but um, I, I think, I think the, the rhetoric is overheated here. Well, we certainly, we, we hear your view, Larry. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure I agree that, that the Constitution is entirely dead. I think, you know, the elasticity of our Constitution often is what uh, has, has borne out its longevity um, and sort of the evolving standards and interpretations. But, you know, I'm going to pitch these things back to the panel. That's why we have all of these experts here for this lively dialogue. I'd like to invite everyone back. We have a couple questions in the queue. Um, so since Larry ended on a, um, sort of talking about Janice, Ruben, I'm going to pitch two questions to you. One is sort of very practical, and then one is, is about what's next. Um, and so the question is, um, the practical question is, can public unions post Janus not be required to represent all employees who refuse to join and contribute um, to the cost of bargaining for wages and benefits? So that's the first part of the question. And then the, and then the, the sort of follow on is um, how workers might use Janus in the future. What do you see as the future post Janus? Well, thanks. I, I, as to the first question, I think you know, the, the reason why you saw a lot of uh, public employers um, defending, uh, you know, the union or, or supporting the union in, in Janus versus AFSCME was that the system of exclusive representation, in other words, one unit for the entire uh, workplace or bargaining unit uh, has worked well uh, over not just, you know, the 41 years since Abood, but also, you know, the uh, 35, or, you know, since 1935 uh, National Labor Relations Act to the private sector and employers like that um, and, and so they have supported this idea of exclusive representation rather than multiple kind of unions. So in theory, uh, unions could, could have multiple pluralistic kind of, uh, you know, groupings of people who agreed with each other and all bargain about different things, but that would really divide their bargaining power, which is one of the central goals of the NLRA and also public sector bargaining law. So, so yes, it's technically possible, um, but, uh, you know, the fact that they were, uh, that that is the outcome or that is the consequence of Janus, I don't think is what anyone really had in, in mind, uh, certainly not uh, a lot of employers. Um, I, I just will also say again that, you know, in terms of like the imbalances that are created by this, you know, as, as I said during my presentation, um, nothing about Janus changed the political spending of unions. That was all still voluntary. So, so supporting candidates or supporting uh, get out the vote kind of uh, um, uh, activities are still kind of, they were always not chargeable, as we say in the labor law parlance, uh, you know, to non-members, right? So what, what, as Larry said, you know, what Janice said is that everything is political now, including, you know, someone is fired from their job and you have to represent, the union has to re represent them in an arbitration or a grievance. And, you know, I, I fail to see how that's political, right? And then finally, I guess, just in terms of the imbalance, I think data I saw from the last midterm elections is that uh, corporate PACs, and again, it depends on how you, how you analyze the data and how you cut it up, whether you're looking at all spending by unions on politics or all spending, including dark money by, by corporations or to serve certain uh, interests, that you know, sort of corporate PAC to labor PAC comparison, corporations spend 3.6 3 times as much as, as labor PACs. So I do think there's still imbalances out there, uh, you know, again, on the, on the corporate side, you know, usually outspending uh, the labor side. On the question of 
what can Janice, how can Janice be used? I mean, I think it's, you know, I'll just say that, you know, it was seen as an existential threat to the labor movement. And, you know, that hasn't played out at this point. I think, as I said, there are some other, there's some other litigation that if it goes forward, it may be even more damaging. But, you know, the, the, the truth is um, there was a loss of members after Janice, but there's kind of as a net kind of, or, or as a catch up, um, a lot of those members have been sort of have rejoined or, or uh, um, you know, the, the loss hasn't been, hasn't been great. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of the other, if, if we're going to talk about weaponizing the First Amendment, again, I think what we're talking about here is conservative justices using the First Amendment as a conservative living constitution. Uh, and I think that is what, you know, we are talking about here rather than, you know, uh, and, and I think if we are going to say, well, maybe progressives should use the First Amendment as a living constitution. We could, we could spend a lot of time talking about other strategies, but I don't think they get the same kind of traction in the Supreme Court. So Ted, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch a question to you on the robocall issue because you raised it. And we have a question here about um, that there was a robocall decision uh, from the Supreme Court last year. Um, and how does that fit within the weaponizing analysis? Or what were you envisioning when you were inviting uh, you know, us either as uh, recipients of robocalls or as lawyers um, to, to get into that arena? Uh, I think that is, this is something that other questions have also touched on, and that is what do judges care about? Uh, and, and often what judges care about is the, actually their own personal experience. Um, the, the robocall case Barr versus AAPC uh, this term uh, involved uh, an exception to the robocall ban uh, for uh, those collecting debt owed to the federal government. And, uh, it, you know, a very strange exception. Uh, and the court uh, using content discrimination analysis, struck that down. But the effect of striking down that exception was to broaden the, the scope and effect of the robocall ban of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. So uh, a very interesting effect that, you know, by, by taking that ideological approach of, of uh, what, I, what I've been calling unification of the First Amendment, uh, we end up with actually a, lim a greater limitation on speech. Why in that particular area was it okay? Was the court willing to do it? I think in part because justices don't like robocalls any more than the rest of us do. Well, I think you're probably right about that. Um, so, so Dean Chemerinsky, I'd like to, to pitch to you a question, um, sort of stepping back a little bit then in the, in the bigger picture. Um, I asked you to think about what you see on the horizon um, and maybe you can comment on what has been folded into the discussion here today about these really, um, you know, whether really strict ideological lines are driving this on the Supreme Court um, and, and whether you see that impacting also the issues that are on the horizon. Oh, I think you're still muted. Uh, there you go. Yeah. I think ideology is very much driving this. It's not coincidence that Janus was a 5-4 decision. It's not coincidence that Nifla versus Becerra was a 5-4 decision. It's not coincidence that Citizens United was a 5-4 decision. In all of them, it was the conservatives in the majority using the First Amendment to strike down progressive legislation, and it was the liberal justices defending it. These decisions can't be justified from an originalist perspective. Take Citizens United as an example. No one can believe that the framers of the First Amendment intended to protect corporations that exist today, let alone to protect unlimited amounts of spending in elections. And obviously, whatever the framers thought of elections in 1791 has no relevance to elections in 2020. That's why originalism makes no sense. Besides that, ultimately the question in constitutional cases is, is there a sufficient justification for the government's action? Is there a compelling interest or an important interest? Originalism provides no answer to that. Larry says, we're saying it's a nefarious plot. He used those words. No one's saying it's a nefarious plot, but what we do have is five justices who are very pro-business. Studies done by Lee Epstein and others have shown this is the most pro-business Supreme Court in history. So it's a court that's using the First Amendment very much to protect the interests of business at the expense of labor and employees, at the expense of consumers. And I think we can continue to see the conservatives doing that and putting in jeopardy so much progressive social legislation. 
Thank you. And so, Larry, I'll, I have a question from the audience for you. Um, so, so the question was um, that question asker says, I understand the general view of the dead constitution, but the others on the panel are not arguing for a new interpretation of the constitution. They're, they're pushing for the interpretation of a decade or two ago. And I think we've heard from several of the panelists that a bunch of the, the key decisions we've been talking about today were a departure from precedent. They, they were not adhering to stare decisis. So um, do, do you have a, some thoughts you can share on that? Yeah, just, just a comment here. Um, no, there, there's no question. When, when Irwin said, you know, these decisions can't be reconciled with an originalist view, what the, what the framers had in mind, now, as I said, now you're playing in my ballpark. That's, that's a perfectly legitimate uh, criticism. Um, if, on the other hand, you just don't like uh, the ideology of, you know, five justices, then this is, this is the thing I worry about with the sort of, when, when you untether constitutional law from its, its the meaning of, that was put in the Constitution and you, you, it becomes just another political battle, uh, one in which the stakes are extremely high, because when the Supreme Court says, this is what we think the Constitution should be here, uh, this is the rule we think is, is good, um, that rule trumps democratic decision making. Now, you know, so, so what, you, what you see here is, is a complaint about the court trumping democratic decision making in terms of values that the panelists say are not in the constitution. Well, you know, all, if you say it's not in the constitution, that's a valid criticism. If you say it's just not my values, not, not the ones I like, that's a different kind of criticism. This, this is what makes the confirmation of Supreme Court justices so nasty and partisan is because the stakes have been ratcheted up. I actually think the Constitution we have speaks very little to the kinds of issues that we have today. Most of those issues, I think, would be left to democratic decision-making by Congress or by the state legislatures. And that's, that's what I think the Constitution actually has. When we have elevated the Constitution to mean a lot more than that, now the stakes get extremely high because we're, we're talking about what judges declare to be the supreme law of the land, even though essentially they've made that up. So I think we'll, all, that's all we have time for today, but what I hear all of us ending on is really a call to action for all of the lawyers and law students um, on this call to think about not just litigation, right, but to also to think about influencing public policy and regulations and um, at the state level, at the local level, and, uh, and, and really trying to shape things there. Um, and so we hope each of you gets more involved with ACS. If you're just learning about us, we hope that you learn more. And I wanna let everybody know that we do have free MCLE credit that is available for today. And ACLE, uh, ACS will be providing the CLE information to each of you after today's session. So with my great gratitude to our all-star panel, thank you so much for being here. I'm sure that um, if, you, if I didn't get to your question, I'm sure that they would be happy to answer it offline, but thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you.